started the company in a windowless phone closet at a warehouse in San Francisco. Now, 12 years later, along with their third co-founder, Renaud Visage, Julia and Kevin Hartz have turned Eventbrite into a global business that powers millions of events in 180 countries around the world, racking up $10 billion in ticket sales. For the first 10 years, Kevin served as CEO. Now Julia is in the chief executive office and driving the company towards an IPO. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Eventbrite co-founders Julia and Kevin Hartz. You founded a company at the same time that you were planning a wedding together. That is a big risk for a future husband and wife. Why did you decide to do it? I have to say that, you know, when Kevin and I first met, I did not know where this was actually going to lead. And it was, you know, part of a two year long evolution of getting to know each other and understanding how we might work together. Ultimately, we had complementary skills. And so, you know, when you find yourself in that situation, you realize that you could be a powerful duo. I think it's a shame if you don't if you don't go for it. Now, Kevin, you were a tech investor. You had invested in PayPal early on. You also founded a company called Zoom, a money transfer company. I, you know, I, I love technology. I had uh, the f front row seat to see what happened at PayPal and the great things that happened there. And so really finding you know the right partner to do this, and we can't leave out Renault, our third co-founder, uh, but it, it just, felt very natural. We weren't entirely sure how it would work out, but it's 10 years, over 10 years later, here we are. In the early days, did you set ground rules, like who does what, what happens if we get in a fight? Probably one of the best things we did was find Renault, who was our co-founding CTO, and I like to say the bravest man on the planet for starting a company with two people who are engaged. As we started to work together, we had this agreement that we would, first of all, divide and conquer, and that we would also always check in. So I was the customer support, marketing, and finance department. Kevin was the product department, and Renault was the engineering department. And we bootstrapped the company. So we were just the three founders for two years. Why events and ticketing? Why did you think that was a problem that needed to be solved or had so much potential? It was addressing this market that had been unaddressed and kind of left to itself. And what's exciting about Eventbrite is we were enabling all these different people and creators to come together and um, host these events that they really couldn't do before. So enabling this, um, you know, this broad, many different categories of events, many different uh, geographies, it's, it was really a greenfield opportunity for us. When you disagreed and when Kevin was CEO, how would that get resolved? We always had the pact that the CEO is the final say. And so I could provide a divergent opinion. Others on the executive team would provide their opinions. And ultimately, Kevin would make a decision. And at Eventbrite, we benefited from coming at problems from different angles. And so Kevin may look at a problem from a, a product angle. I may look at it from a customer angle. But we meet in the middle. And similarly now, I feel that autonomy and, you know, I, I have the support of Kevin and our board. Uh, Kevin is the chairman of our board and my executive team that I've not only recruited and developed, but I've been in the trenches with them, some of them for up to seven years. Now, talking about the opportunity, when you guys started raising money, it was like the middle of the financial crisis, right? It was not a good time. We had um, said, let's bootstrap this company, let's not take outside funding, we're going to build a very efficient, profitable business. Is that because of something that you learned from, you know, starting Zoom, of the, like the challenges of dealing with investors? You know, just seeing in the previous cycle of the crash of 2000, 2001, uh, that it was very dangerous to be relying on capital. And, and we've seen that consistently through this cyclical period. So we're in a period of a 10 year expansion. Right now, everything is up and to the right. Uh, but uh, we like to be the masters of our own destinies. But at a certain point, you needed to raise money. Yes, we chose the worst time to go out. Going out in late 2008 was a really special experience. Uh, but it, it taught us a lot. So I think we met with 27 or so uh, venture capital firms, and we were turned down by all of them. So that experience teaches you a lot, right? Going into the room and, and having to answer really critical questions about your business model. Sometimes it takes a down market to create that, that critical 
question asking moment. And I think if we'd gone out during a frothier time, we wouldn't have have faced that. And so what we did, and I really attribute this to you, is we left everybody with our 2009 plan, our annual plan. And we just came back towards the end of 2009 and showed our results. And that spoke for itself. It was a very different experience. It wasn't easy, but I think that people were surprised by how much traction we had in such a difficult market. Sequoia led your first round. That's right, and uh, you know we were really excited to. I was excited to work again with Roloff and who you uh, worked with at PayPal. Who I knew from PayPal, and he's worked with Zoom. He's worked with us at Eventbrite, and he um, he's been fantastic. Most people that we talk to, they say, I can't imagine working with my spouse. Can't imagine it. We would kill each other. So Kevin, you stepped down as CEO in 2016, in part, you said, due to health issues. How are you feeling? How are you doing? I, I'm feeling great. I'm a uh, 100%. Uh, and, you know, serendipitously, kind of odd, oddly, it was uh, really a great transition because, you know, we had a founder in the building in Julia that had been, really had this great insight about the business, these, you know, really great uh, perspectives, and she stepped up during an incredibly tough time, you know, personally, uh, where, you know, she really was kind of taking care of me at that point, uh, but also, uh, you know, really took the baton and, and um, has been fantastic. I know that this was a moment for you, Julia. There was, a, you know, a vacuum leadership to fill, but also you had, you know, th this personal situation in your life that you had to deal with. Yeah, well, I mean, it's hard for me not to get emotional because when we talk about it, it's like I'm right back there again. It was difficult. You know, it, it the most difficult part was uh, the notion that we wouldn't be sitting side by side every day. I know that sounds cheesy, but we actually have sat in, at desks next, next to each other for, uh, by then, a whole decade. Um, and so, you know, that, that was probably the scariest part, was for some people, or most people that we talk to, they say, I can't imagine working with my spouse. Can't imagine it. We would kill each other. That's what we hear all the time. If you can imagine, that was the normal for us. That's our normal. So I was terrified of what it would do to us as a partnership. Uh, when we didn't work together every day. It was, it was sort of uh, the opposite. And so I think that's the thing that I was afraid of most. And I have to say that now, almost two years into this new normal, we've really found our stride as being, you know, cooperating in this, in this new construct. I want to talk about how you became CEO, because it wasn't actually obvious. It wasn't an automatic, now Julia is going to be CEO. In fact, you had to propose this idea. I think it was really important for us to try to be very objective and to rely on our board to make the right call. But I did need to tell Kevin that I that I was ready, and that was scary because you know it. it you never, I don't know, you never, you just don't know what's on the other side of that. And how did you tell him? We were on an airplane, and I had a glass of wine. <laughs> And I, I said, you know, I, I, think, I think I might be ready. I think this is something I'd like to propose to the board. Um, but I wanted the board to know that they had the space to make the decision if they wanted to run a process, if they wanted to, you know, take time. Kevin, how did you react when she told you that she wanted to be CEO? Well, I, I mean, I thought it was an ideal situation, and uh, not just because she's extremely talented, but also because um, typically when you have these CEO transitions, the first job to, of the new CEO is to, you know, explain how horrible the past <laughs> CEO was. But because we lived together, you know, she kind of couldn't get away with that. that. So the, you know, like the, this is how you unload to the board all these challenges. Um, and, and unfortunately, she was restricted from doing that. But. Well, I also was there for the <laughs> 10 years that we, so any mistake we've made or lesson we've learned is something that I was a part of. You are one of few female CEOs and founders. And I know when you took the job, there were nerves about whether people would take you seriously. How did you 
overcome that. I put my head down and focused on what we needed to do as a business. This has been a tremendous growth period for Eventbrite and I had to get to work. And so I sort of let all of that fall away and I just focused on building the right team for the future, on executing, on really making sure that the culture, um, which is global, right? We have Brightlings all over the world, that everyone understood that we were going to be okay. Because I think these big moments of transition can be unnerving. It can create uncertainty, even if you know there's nothing wrong. Um, and so I needed them to, to know that I was aware of that and that we were all in this together. And then as you take the, the helm, like when I felt the difference of being CEO, that made me really respect some of the founder CEOs that I know in, in you know, the, the women that I've watched grow their companies. It's sort of like when you, uh, when you have your first baby and then you, and you go back to work and you have immense respect for the women who have children and work. I felt the same way about, about taking the reins as CEO. The company Eventbrite actually has is pretty solid when it comes to gender diversity. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear from both of you how you did that. We are actually still almost 50-50, uh, despite you know we, we have acquired some companies that have different gender ratios. We have always been focused on trying to build a company that looks like our community, and our community of creators is global, right? So diversity has to be embedded in, in what we do. So me being a, a female CEO certainly provides a great embedded role model at Eventbrite, but inclusion is entirely a choice. Mm -hmm. And you can have great diversity and really not great inclusion. I think that just as a company needs a competitive advantage, whether it's a technology or advantage or a network-based um, business, there's a recruiting advantage that needs to be built, and all the great companies have come up with very specific recruiting advantages, whether it was like Microsoft recruiting from uh, young students out of college in, in the 80s. We saw this, you know, unfortunate bro culture um, here in this very competitive San Francisco environment, and we saw all this talent available. Uh, so, uh, you know, for us, hiring moms and, and, and looking broader than people that look just like ourselves uh, was a competitive advantage. So how did you do that? There's a stereotype of the 20-something male um, engineer, and, you know, you have these incredibly talented uh, women in the Bay Area that have maybe had children and they maybe unconsciously get written off. And, you know, I, we saw that as our competitive advantage. The maternity leave is a great time to recruit someone, by the way, because you have this moment of reflection and there is uh, a varying degree of which companies decide to support people who are going through such an important milestone. And don't even get me started on I, this. This is a great subject for me to pontificate on. So it's very curious to me that in, especially in the US corporate culture, we basically penalize people for procreating. Which pregnancy is a medical despite condition. It, yeah, exactly. It's despite, a disability. Despite anybody's, you know, broad religious beliefs, like I'm pretty sure we're supposed to be, right, procreating on some level as humans. And so that I think is curious. When you look at it and you say, okay, this is not only a moment where somebody's going through a major life transition, and this is for men and women, but they're also fearful of what their life is going to look like. Are their careers gonna go off track? Are their peers going to think about them differently? Are they not going to be able to juggle, you know, or as I like to say, put the jigsaw puzzle together. There's always a piece missing under the couch, right? Of just life, of balancing kids and career. And so all of our sort of, you know, policies around that are great, but it's really about how we treat each other. It's about how we show up for each other. And so part of that, I think, is identifying that really talented candidates, especially in competitive markets, may be reflecting on what their experience 
is at their own company, right, during that leave period. So what do you think the biggest risks to the business are, the biggest challenges that lie ahead? I mean, we hear about things like scalping or the fact that you can't get a ticket to Hamilton if you're just a regular Joe. Well, I mean, uh, you know, if you just look at the, the blockchain uh, that's, you know, there you have a, a, a means of actually um, assigning ownership and having clarity of, of who actually owns a ticket and, and being able to transfer that properly and, and, not, um, and, and not have it end up in the hands of a scalper that then the artist doesn't benefit, the creator doesn't benefit, uh, it's a third party taking a, a big cut, um, it's some scalper taking a big cut in a third party platform. Um, so there's a lot of ways that technology can address that that you'll see. It's up to us to, to build or to or lose to a competitor. So it's on our shoulders, and that means um, continuing to build the best team we, we can do. So you've been very straightforward about going public. You've said it will happen. When will it happen? Um, you know, when I think about what we've accomplished in the last decade plus, right, we've had in excess of $10 billion of gross ticket sales flow through Eventbrite, and we're just getting started. So if you're sitting in my seat and you're looking out over the horizon, you're really thinking about how do I build this for the long term? And we've never shied away from saying that, you know, when the timing's right, if Eventbrite's ready and is the type of company that can be a successful public company, we're going to go for it. I would just add that, you know, we, we're in an environment where uh, it used to be, I think it was John Doerr that said that after six quarters of revenue growth, that it was time to go public. That was like the sentiment of, of tech in the 90s, that you would be out really quickly. And now we've kind of swung the other direction where uh, companies are just staying private for a very long time. And that, um, that can have a detrimental effect because you don't have the kind of light, the, the sunshine of the public markets to shine in and, and kind of um, breed more accountability and, and a lot of bad things can happen. So um, we, I, I see personally um, a lot of benefits to going public and, and you know, the, the company's ready when, when, uh, um, when Julia's ready to make that call. You invested in PayPal, you invested in YouTube, you invested in Pinterest. Pretty good hit record. What's your secret? Kevin, I want to talk a little bit about your investing career. When you stepped down as CEO, you became a partner at Founders Fund. And in fact, you've been investing for a really long time, starting with PayPal. Well, I've always seen it uh, maybe as a investing as kind of a, a selfish endeavor in the sense, in, in one sense that I, I love to learn from really bright, um, talented founders that can give me a new perspective. But I, I guess what I really love about it is, is helping, you know, kind of paint it forward. And you did this on the side, right? Um, it, like throughout it the entire very natural. Time. It was, uh, you know, instead of going to some type of club or, um, you know, playing golf, it was uh, working with, with young founders and, and new companies. And um, I could kind of pattern match and, and learn a lot. So you invested in PayPal, you invested in YouTube, you invested in Pinterest. PayPal, Airbnb, uh, Pinterest, uh, Uber. It's a pretty good hit record. What's your secret? Uh, what is my secret? I, I you know, I, again, I'm just looking for at, at really talented people that um, kind of look at the world in a different way and and are, are so impassioned about what they do and want to have a positive impact on the world. I, I think you said you said something like he you you met with 900 companies your first year. I, I think it was uh, 951 companies. Wow, you met with 951 companies in one year. That's dedication. You know, obviously we didn't um, fund most of those companies, uh, but I think what's exciting about this period as well is the, is the capital available is just the wide variety, you know, whether it's um, synthetic proteins or space travel or, um, you know, something in the, in the biotech space, this is an incredible period to build and, and you know, really impact society. So how did you end up going with Founders Fund, which is one of the more sort of controversial funds? And Peter Thiel is certainly well known for his support of Donald Trump, but also, you know, investing in very out of this world ideas. Why did you choose them? I 
knew Peter uh, while I was an undergrad at Stanford University. I was involved in student politics. And, and this is where I give the disclaimer. I was chair of the Stanford Democrats, uh, and and Peter was um, you know staunchly conservative libertarian, uh, but uh, there was I, I love the diversity of opinion that that existed there. And while I didn't agree with a lot of his views, I uh, was keen to hear his perspectives because they're they're insightful. I guess I would say it's unfortunate. It feels like that um, you know there's a little bit of group think happening in the valley right now that that maybe uh, kind of muffles or, or kind of dims other perspectives um, that we could be a little more open-minded to. Uh, the second reason is really the, you know, how uh, this is a, a partnership of a, a group of real dreamers truly investing in, in kind of really um, world-changing ideas, whether it was uh, initial investment in Facebook or uh, being the first institutional backers of SpaceX and, and Elon Musk. Um, it's, it's great to see these independent thinkers that, that take risks in this manner. Peter has caught a lot of flack for supporting President Trump, and Founders Fund, to a certain extent, has been dragged into that. What's it been like to sort of weather that behind the scenes, given that we're in the heart of the left-leaning West Coast? I try not to get caught up in the drama of the headlines, um, albeit uh, exciting, salacious headlines. Uh, but it's, it's um, yeah, I guess it's so never it a dull never a moment. So it was never a distraction? Uh, you, know, maybe, you know, perhaps uh, here and there, I, I, I wouldn't over-exaggerate it, but. So um, Peter is now mo moving to LA, as we understand, because of this sort of group think that you mentioned and his um, dissatisfaction with that. What does that mean for Founders Fund? Well, um, that you know, that's Peter's choice, and Founders Fund is a partnership. So I, I think you know, often incorrectly, it's it's viewed as as Peter, but it's it's made up of a diverse set of investors, um, and you know, we'll continue and work along with Peter. Uh, but there are other great team members, whether uh, it's Scott or Lauren or Brian or Cyan. Um, you know, this is a, a partnership and, and not around one person. What's it like being married to a venture capitalist now? <laughs> What's it like to be married to Kevin? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you feel underaccomplished just by the sheer number of uh, meetings that he takes. And then to realize that even despite him meeting somehow 951 companies in the first 12 months, he is a 50-50 partner to me at home. So we co-raise our parent our um, co-raise co-raise our children together we in do co-raise our parents we do also co-raise our parents sorry mom dad um and uh and and just how involved he is and so i i i do have to say i know this i i don't know where you find time um but it's it's been great to watch well, him jump but in. it yeah, it pales into comparison to what julia has done over these last two years at eventbrite as ceo and how uh, the company has grown and expanded, and um, I'm so excited for the future. Kevin and Julia Hartz, co-founders of Eventbrite, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg Studio 1.0.